sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. City people are gregarious by nature, and they feel more at home in a crowd. Rural folks, on the other hand, usually prefer solitude. And they derive a certain comfort from the lonely acres, the quiet, and the peace. My personal choice? Well, <laughs> that's not an easy question to answer. Time moves quickly in the city, and the minutes are filled with a certain hubbub and excitement that throbs and pulses like a living thing. While in the country, time has a more leisurely pace, and a man can spend his hours in reflection. <laughs> No offense to my city friends, of course, but I'd say I was a country bumpkin at heart. Particularly now, with winter coming on. When the snow begins to fly, the sleigh bells tinkle a merry tune along the backwoods road. Hey, we saw this house is just round the bend, about half a mile up the road. Do you know her, Mr. Kibby? Miss Hobson? <laughs> hey, reckon I do. We've both been living in these parts for quite a spell. I haven't seen my aunt in over a year. She was Mother's favorite sister. Oh, an awful lot of fun. You go to spend some time here? I've been invited for several weeks. Oh, over the holidays, eh? That's right. Yeah. Seems to me your aunt ought to be mighty happy to have a cheerful young gal like you around for a while. <laughs> it's kind of lonely way up here in the woods. I suppose it does. And your aunt ain't been coming to town as much as she used to. The uh, fact the matter is, I... I thought the house was closed. Really? Yeah, I ain't seen Miss Hobson in so many months, I, I figured maybe she'd gone away. Then I heard she'd gotten sick, and uh, she went somewhere to uh, the hospital. No! Well, them things happen. Oh, I'm sure she must be all right now, or she wouldn't have invited me. Do you know what was wrong with her? Uh, no, I, I couldn't say, Miss, but uh, at least she come back. What do you mean, at least she came back? Uh, well, now, I, I ain't going to spoil your holiday with country gossip. If it has anything to do with Aunt Emmy. Oh, no, no, nothing like that. I, I just thinking that someone else went away. Never returned. Disappeared like a puff of smoke. Ain't found hiding the hair of him for two months. You try to frighten me with a country ghost story, Mr. Gibby? It's a fact, miss. Fellow named Collins... Albert Collins came up through these parts one October evening, uh, yeah, around Halloween, and he ain't been seen since. <laughs> it would be Halloween. Was he carried away by a witch on a broomstick? You can joke about it, miss, but the folks round about here have the feeling that Collins was murdered. Murdered? Of course, that's just hearsay. When a man disappears without leaving a trace... Yeah, nice fellow, this Collins. Uh, he was a necktie salesman. Necktie salesman? Yeah, he carried a fancy line. He, 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 one of the boys at the general store said that he was probably strangled with one of his own neckties. <laughs> I don't think that's very funny, Mr. Kibby. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, uh, get up there. Get up there, Gideon. Oh, I was hoping it'd snow this way for the holidays. Well, uh, You'd better start hoping it'll stop. Why? There's over two foot on the ground already. If she keeps up like this till morning, the Hobson farm will be snowed in. Oh, I won't mind. It'll be fun. What could be more romantic than a snowdrift in front of the door and a roaring fire? Yeah, I guess Miss Hobson's put in enough supplies. She's been caught in the blizzard before. Water, Gideon, water! What are you stopping here for? The house is behind them trees, over yonder. 
Oh, yes, I see it. Can't go no further in the snow. Reckon you'll have to walk from here. Well, good thing I brought my galoshes. Oh, this is grand. What do I owe you? Fifty cents, miss. Here, keep the change. Thank you kindly. Hello there. Who's that? Don't rightly know. Looking for someone? Yeah, I'm going to Miss Miss Hobson's house. I'm Sid, a hired hand. Then give the young lady a lift for them bags. I said I'm Miss Hobson's hired hand. Not hers. Oh, never mind. I'll carry them myself. Well, uh, I'll take one of them. Yeah, that's decent of you. Well, uh, so long, young lady. Have a good time for yourself. Thank you. Get up, Gideon, get up. Well, I, I guess we'd better go. You sure you got the right place? Of course. I'm Miss Hobson's niece. She invited me up. Well, you ain't expected. What? I said she doesn't know you're coming. But she invited me. That's news to me. Would you mind picking up that bag and leading the way? Suit yourself. All I know is that she don't know you're coming. I only hope she don't get mad. Miss Hobson. What is it, Sid? Looks like you've got company. Lucy. Hello, Aunt Emmy. Oh, this is a pleasant surprise. Surprise? I guess I better get some more wood for the fire. Why didn't you tell me you were coming? Aunt Emmy, I... What's he looking at? All right, Sid. Get your wood. Yes, ma'am. He's not very pleasant, is he? <laughs> Sid? Oh, he means no harm. He works hard, but only for me. He's handy to have around, even though his disposition isn't very good. Oh, sit down, Lucy, and tell me how you've been. Oh, I've been fine. I haven't seen or heard from you in over a year. Where have you been keeping yourself? I was just going to ask you the same question. I heard you were ill, Aunt Emmy. Oh, it wasn't serious. I need to rest more than anything else. I left the hospital just two days ago. What was the matter with you? It was um, mental more than anything else. Mental? Well, I mean, it was mostly in my imagination. Oh, but let's not talk about that now. I'll show you to your room, Lucy. Come with me. All right. Oh, you've got such a pretty place here, Aunt Emmy. It's so warm and comfortable. We don't depend on just a fire for our heat, Lucy. I have a modern furnace in the cellar, you know. <laughs> Sid said he keeps it hot enough to fry a man alive. What did you say? Well, nothing. What's the trouble, Lucy? You look rather nervous. Oh, I guess I'm just a little tired, that's all. It's been a long trip. Yes. Well, you'll get a good night's rest in here. This guest room's very comfortable. And it's certainly nice to have someone in it again. Hasn't been occupied since I went to hospital. On Halloween. Halloween? Oh, dear, Sid forgot to clear these bureau drawers. Never I'll... mind about it, Aunt Emmy. I'll take care... Lucy, what's the matter? The straw's full of ties. Men's neckties. Oh, they were left here quite by accident. You see, I rent this room out occasionally to tourists and salesmen. My last guest left those in the drawer. What was his name, Aunt Emmy? Collins. Albert Collins. <laughs> See, I thought you'd gone to bed. I couldn't sleep, Aunt Emmy. You're not ill. Uh, no, just restless. Well, sit down and keep me company. Aunt Emmy? Yes, dear? Why did you have to stay at the hospital as long as you did? Oh, they wanted to look me over and ask a lot of questions. What kind of questions? I can hardly remember. Would you like some hot coffee, Lucy? Oh, no, I... I've just made some. It should be ready by now. Excuse me. Oh, I'll answer that, Emmy. Hello? State police calling. State police? Yes, we're issuing a warning to all residents of Calville. A woman inmate at the state hospital for the insane has escaped. She's in this vicinity and she may be dangerous. 
paranoid type. Be sure and... Hello? Who was it, Lucy? <gasps> Aunt Amy. Who called just now? The poli... I, I mean, I'm not sure. Something happened to the phone. The phone? Let me have it. That's odd. Oh, well, the heavy snowfall must have pulled the wires down. It's happened before. Can we fix it? Not before morning. Are you sure you don't know who it was who called, Lucy? Quite sure. I think you'd better go to bed. To bed? You look so tired, Lucy. Oh, I, I'm all right, honey. I'd rather not sleep in there alone. Would you like to sleep with me in my room? No, no. Lucy. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm just not tired, that's all. Please don't coax me. Besides, it's still early. Well, I think I'll go down to the cellar and bank the furnace fire. But it's so warm in here right now. No, I like a real hot fire. But what about Sid? Doesn't he do that? He's probably gone to bed. I won't disturb him. Oh. Well, do you want me to go with you, Aunt Emmy? No, I'll manage alone. Somehow I manage to do almost anything alone. Lucy! I just thought I'd, I'd join you, Aunt Emmy. Oh, but it's so drafty down here in the cellar. I don't mind. Lucy, there's something worrying you. Uh, no, Aunt Emmy. What is it, my dear? What's frightened you so? Aunt Emmy, please answer me directly. Answer? What for, Lucy? About that hospital. Aunt Emmy, tell me, did you... <coughs> Lucy, what is it? That axe there in the corner. It's got blood on the blade. Why, so it has. And there's a pool of blood on Emmy on the floor. Lucy, Lucy, dear, oh. it's Aunt Amy. What happened? Oh, you fainted, Lucy. I carried you up here. Oh, that blood on the cellar floor. It was only chicken blood. Chicken blood? The roaster we had for dinner. Sid must have killed it downstairs. Where is he, Aunt Emmy? Sid? Yes, I want to talk to him. What on earth? Oh. Let me go, Aunt Emmy. Lucy, Emmy, I... Where is his room? Oh, over there across the hall. Sid. Sid. Doesn't he answer? Sid! Just a moment, Lucy. Why, he's... He's gone. Gone? Well, his bed hasn't been slept in. I, I can't imagine. He may be in the woolshed. Oh, not in this weather. No, he's gone. And I had such faith in Sid. I didn't think he'd desert me. Could, could he have walked out through the snow? It may not be so deep. Close that door, Lucy. You'll catch your death of cold. I can't even see the road anymore. You couldn't get through that storm alive in a thousand years. What's the matter with you, Lucy? Why are you behaving this way? What did you want with Sid? Nothing. Anymore. We don't need a man around. We're perfectly safe. No one will disturb us here, Lucy. We'll spend the night alone. Just the two of us. Time like falling snow adds up its hours quietly. You can sometimes hear the seconds go by, but the passing of the years is always silent. As silent as a country house marooned in snowdrifts, cut off completely from the world, and sheltering two women who are playing hostesses to terror. Hey, it's two o'clock in the morning, Lucy. I heard the chimes. 
Shall I put another log on the fire? If you like. You're very strong, Aunt Emmy. I always have been. You carried me up the stairs from the cellar like you would have carried a baby. You'll always be a baby, Lucy, to me. I can remember when you were five years old. I took care of you while your mother was away. Do you know what was wrong with Mother Aunt Emmy? Do you? I wasn't supposed to know, but I found out. She went crazy, Lucy. Yes. She and Father. They said it ran in the family. From Father to... How can you talk about it, Aunt Emmy? Isn't it better to face the truth? Sometimes it helps you to understand. Do you remember your mother very well? Yes. We were twins, Lucy. She and I. That's why I was always so fond of you. And I of you, Lucy. I still love you, Aunt Emmy, in spite of... In spite of what? Let's talk about something else. Come over here and sit with me. No, I'll stay where I am. Lucy, what's wrong? I wish you hadn't spoken about Mother, that's all. She was a wonderful woman. But she was a paranoiac. Is that what they called it? She had a persecution mania. She, she even... Killed a man, yes. Poor Flora. And now? And now? Oh, Aunt Emmy. Aunt Emmy. Oh, Lucy. Lucy, darling. Don't come near me. Lucy. Why don't you go to bed? Why don't you leave me alone and go to bed? I'm not tired anymore. Oh, Lucy, you worry me. I, I know you're not yourself. I want to get a doctor for you. Now? Can you get one now? No one can get through these drifts until morning, when the snowplow clears the way. And I wanted snow so badly. Lucy, I have something here that could put you to sleep. Some pills. Will you take them? No, never. But they're harmless. I won't eat or drink anything while I'm in this house. Well, Lucy, the way you talk, one would think I was trying to poison you. I don't want anything, do you hear? Nothing. Just as you say. That coffee you gave me before. Coffee? I drank it all. What was in it, Aunt Emmy? What did you put in it? Nothing, Lucy, nothing at all. How do I know? You know because I'm telling you. And I always tell the truth. Oh, yes. Y yes, of course you do. I'm sorry, Aunt Emmy. I, I apologize. That's quite all right. I apologize for everything I've said tonight. Don't pay any attention to it, please. I've been overworked and nervous. Please forgive me. Of course, I understand, my dear. Aunt Emmy. Yes? Why is it so warm in here? I told you before we keep the furnace hot. But it's so warm, it's uncomfortable. It's getting almost hard to breathe. <laughs> That's just your imagination. Let me go down to the cellar and have a look. I Stay where you are, Lucy. Why? Is there something you don't want me to see? Whatever do you mean? I mean inside that furnace. There's nothing inside there but embers. I don't believe you. Lucy. You're burning something down there. That's why you rake those coals yourself. You're burning something. Lucy, be quiet. I'm... I'm being very silly, aren't I? Very. You wouldn't hurt me, would you, Aunt Emmy? Oh, never. Aunt Emmy, you always said you loved me. You still do, don't you? More than anything else in the world, Lucy. Then let me go. Let me leave here, please. In the storm. I don't care about the storm. I'm getting out. Lucy. Let me go. Let me go. Be quiet. Be quiet, you hear. Oh, all right, Aunt Emmy. I'll be quiet. Please let me go. Sit down where you were, Lucy. And relax. All right. You'll get sleepy soon. Then you can go to bed. No, no, I want to stay up all night. I don't want to sleep, Aunt Emmy. You don't have to. Providing you're quiet. 
Hmm. That fire seems to be dying out. What are you doing with that fire poker? Tending the fire. Why don't you put it back in the rack? No, I'll keep it here with me. And Emmy? Yes. I've changed my mind. I am beginning to feel very tired. Do you want to go to sleep? Y yes. Good, I'll see you at your room. Oh, don't bother. I I'll go along. Oh, nonsense. I'll go with you. And I'll tuck you in. There, you'll be comfortable in here. It's still so warm. I'm going to open those shutters. Why won't they open? They're locked from the outside, Lucy. Why? Because of the storm. That isn't the reason. If you open those shutters, Lucy, the snow will come in. And I don't want you to catch pneumonia. Aunt Emmy, I demand that you open those shutters. No, Lucy. You'll sleep with them closed tonight. Good night, my dear. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Time moves on. I wonder what the clock holds for Lucy. Who's there? Is that you, Lucy? Keep away from me. What are you doing with that kitchen knife? You're not going to kill me, do you hear? Kill you? You took the fire poker when you went to bed and you locked me in. Oh, did I? It must have been an accident. It was no accident. You deliberately locked me inside my room. What did you plan to do, Aunt Emmy? Strangle me in my sleep? Lucy, how I could got out. you? Yes, I got out. There was a screwdriver in the drawer. It took me three hours to get that lock off, but I got out. I'm sorry how about that. How did you plan that? to get rid of me? The way you got rid of Albert Collins? Collins? You killed him. That's why he's been missing. You killed him and burned him in that furnace. Give me that knife, Lucy. And last night you killed Sid. Lucy, don't deny it. I saw the axe and the pool of blood. Chicken blood. Do you think I was a child? you expect me to believe that? I said, give me that knife. You put Sid in the furnace, and that's why the house was so hot. You burned him, Aunt Emmy, but you're not going to do the same to me. You're wrong about Collins, Lucy. He may have disappeared, but I have nothing to do with it. I explained that satisfactorily to the police. The way you are going to explain Sid's death and mine? No, Lucy. You won't kill me because I'll kill you first with this knife. No, Aunt Emmy, no. No, Lucy. I'll kill you. Do you hear? I'll kill you. Lucy. Lucy, stop it. Here she is, Doctor. Here she is. Aunt Emmy's insane, completely insane, like my mother was. But I'm going to kill her. I... It's all right, Lucy. Everything's all right now. Yeah. You're perfectly safe. Oh. With me. Safe? Give me the knife, Lucy. The knife? That's a good girl. Thank heaven. Sid got through to you in time. Yes, he uh, just made him, Miss Hobson. And he got the snow plow to clear the way for us up the road. Thank heaven for that. Uh, when, when did you find out, Miss Hobson? As soon as she walked in here. She didn't realize that I knew where she'd been for the past 12 months. Lucy? Yes, Doctor? We go back to the hospital now? Yes, Doctor. Goodbye, Aunt Emmy. Goodbye, Lucy, darling. It's been a pleasant holiday. A very pleasant holiday. 
I've had a most enjoyable time. And I'll remember you to Mother. And that was the story of Lucy as recorded by the clock. <laughs> what was I saying about the country before? The quiet, the peace. Apparently the city is much less wearing on the nerves, but be that as it may, I'm still a rural booster deep inside. I love the rolling hills and valleys, but most of all I like the people. They treat me well. They make the most of me. From sunrise when the chores begin to sunset when the fire is lighted on the hearth and the family settled down for a well-earned rest. And on Sunday, I put on my Sabbath best and roost high up on the steeple of the church. No elegance up there. No chromium-plated grandeur of the city towers. Just a rustic simplicity. A good place to spend my time. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. It was written by Lawrence Clee and Harp McGuire narrated as the clock. As Lucy, you heard Coralie Neville... As Emmy, Lynn Murphy. Others were Tom Farley, Ken Wayne, and John Tate. The Clock is directed by John Saul, a Grace Gibson radio production. is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Almost anyone else, I'm rather proud of my family tree. My ancestry dates back to the first sunrise, if you'll be tolerant of a bit of boasting. Like Adam and Eve, my family made its beginning with day and night. Later, we expanded. You heard of the sundial? Well, he was a grand old patriarch on my father's side. And I've had a few famous cousin and aunts in the Middle Ages. They measured their existence by notches on a tallow candle. As the family grew, so grew our prestige. Big Ben, for instance, is a famous relation of mine. Yes. In the old days, we were very dignified and severe. But today? Well, the younger generation is rather frivolous, I'm afraid. My great-great-grandfather was a solid old gentleman who was very close to the King of France. He ought to see his great-great-grandniece. Of all things, she's decided to become a wristwatch. The old gentleman would burst a mainspring if he knew. Yes, we're all a bit proud of our ancestry just as the Bradfords are. Important people, the Bradfords, born to the purple, so to speak. They have a townhouse in the city, a villa in the south of France, and a hunting lodge. But the hunting lodge is by far their favorite rendezvous. Another sherry, Ken? No, thanks, Diana. I'll have another brandy. Don't you think you've had enough? Don't be silly. You ought to give my sister a little talking to, Ken. She's getting to be a reformer. I'm no reformer, Bud. It merely bores me to see you drinking yourself to death. Not a chance. I intend to remain alive for a long, long time. I'll leave you to learn, Diana. He's all right. Well, the dog's in fine shape for the morning, Tunt. We'll show you a bit of quail hunting, Kent, that you've never seen before. Sounds good, Charles. How can you be interested in quail after bagging a tiger in India and wild buffalo on the African veld? Oh, don't let my wife discourage you, Kent. I, I promise you plenty of excitement in the morning. Are you coming with us, Diana? No, I'm staying here. Diana feels that a quail is no match for her shooting eye. And I'm inclined to agree. By George, that woman's the best shot in the country. And quite a hunter, too. I understand my sister can stalk and kill an animal even better than a lion can. Of course, she does have to use a gun to do it. Now, look here, Bud. Oh, leave him alone, Charles. He doesn't annoy me. Bud, just a bit squeamish about hunting. He feels it's a little like murder. Well, isn't it? You brag about bagging tigers in India, but how do you do it? 
There's a back of an elephant or a platform on top of a tree. Your sister's gone after tigers on foot, but... I've done the same thing, but it is a dangerous business. Funny thing, Kent, but, but you're the only one I, I can't make out. Diana's had a nose for hunting ever since I can remember. She started as a kid, with a trap for rats, and ended up on rhino. Much to Bud's unhappiness. Her psychology and Charles, I can understand. They have a yen to kill, and they've found a way to do it legally. Bud! Oh, let him talk. He's very interesting. But you, Kent, you're different, have I? You're not a savage, a, a, a marauder. You're a civilized man. <laughs> uh, why do you indulge in such an uncivilized practice? Well, perhaps it flatters my ego, Bud. Perhaps I'm a little more barbarous than you think I am. Bud can never understand the thrill of hunting because he's never done it. He doesn't know what it means to match your wits with a wild animal. To stalk and find out with something that's a thousand times your superior in strength and cunning. I wonder how you'd feel, Diana. If instead of being the hunter, you became the hunted. Yes. Yes, I've often wondered what had happened if the roles were reversed. And we were trying to avoid being killed by the animals. Well, that happens very often in India. Among the natives, tigers have been known to carry off human beings. Well, but those people aren't hunters, as you and I are. Well, in any case, young man, you have no right to condemn anything without having experienced it yourself. Why don't you go out with Charles and Kent in the morning, bud? I refuse to kill for no reason at all. You needn't hunt. You can watch. It might give you an even better argument against what you insist on calling murder. All right, I will. I'll go along with you two homicidal nimrods. I only hope I have the stomach to speak to either of you after it's over. <laughs> Oh, my handsome brother isn't quite as chicken-hearted as I thought he was. Where are you going, bud? Up to bed. And I'm taking the brandy bottle with me. Uh, the young man's a little too big for his britches. The result is too much money, I'm afraid. Well, I'm turning in myself. Are you coming, dear? No, I'll have a cigarette first, Charles. You go ahead. Uh, we'll be ready to leave at 5 a.m., Kent. I'll be up. I'll see you in the morning, then. Goodbye. Good night, Charles. Has it been a pleasant weekend, Kent? Yes, very pleasant, Diana. I'm glad I was invited. There won't be many more invitations like this. Have I abused my privilege as a guest? No. We've abused ours as hosts. Well, how do you mean? We're setting new state. Really? Together with a house in France, in the townhouse. But why, Diana? What for? My husband is going into bankruptcy. No. But don't look so shocked. He isn't the first. But I, I... I just don't understand. I thought Charles was a very wealthy man. He was, yes. But money has a habit of disappearing when you spend it like water. And you're never around to manage your business affairs. I see. But what about your brother, Bud? Can't he help you out? He could, but he won't. He's still got every penny he inherited from father. And he'll continue to have it and keep it for himself. <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter, really. Do get along. If there were anything I could do, I... Well, it's sweet as you can. But you're no millionaire. And the amount we need much too large. We are used to living high, and we can't reform. My husband's a fool. And I have to pay for his unbusiness-like qualities. I suppose I'd have been better off if I had married a man like you. Diana... Please, don't let's go into that again. You know how I feel about it. Yes. Yes, of course. A gentleman never makes love to his first wife. Diana, please. All right, we'll let it go at that. I'm tired. I think I'll turn in. You're sure you won't come along with us in the morning? No, thanks. But I'll see you at dinner when you return. All right. And Ken? Yes? Good hunting, By the morning, eh, kids? Wonderful, Charles. A perfect morning for killing. Now, look here, bud. If you're coming along with us, let's have another bet. <laughs> bud, try to be tolerant until the hunt is over. Ah, oh, that's my bet. Those are two very excellent pointers you have there, Charles. The uh, king over here is the better one. Huh? The prince is just a bit over anxious at times. He's inclined to false point, I guess. I think Queenie's caught a glance here. What happens when those dogs locate the unlucky creatures to you? You butcher them in their nests? We flush them before we shoot, but we don't fire unless they're on the wing. That's very decent of them. And the dogs are entering the woods. Perhaps they're after something a little bigger than quail. Well, oh, I doubt it. Uh, let's follow them in. Now, 
really the most ridiculous. Will you be thing. quiet, please, Charles? There's the prince. He's frozen one pocket. Steady there. He's your bird, Kent. Nice shot. Wonderful. Oh, go on, Prince. Retrieve him. That's on. Found an animal standing stock still. By the way, where's the other dog? Where's King? Uh, King? King boy! Funny, just a minute, Charles. Let's have a look behind those trees. Wait. It's King. He's been hurt. Uh, he's dead. Do you think one of our shots might No. Have... Look at this wound in his breast. Oh, that's the way it appears to me. Poor animal. Poor animal. What about me? This dog was expensive. Took me years to train. Oh, I feel sorry for you too, Charles. What could have killed this dog? I can't make it out. I didn't hear any sound. Did you, bud? Only the barking. But yet, look at that throat. The king was large for his breed. He could put up a fight if he wanted to. And we'd have heard it if he did. Let's get the prince over here. See if he can pick up a scent. Where in blazes is he? He's in there just a moment ago. Prince! He must be behind that clearing, Charles. Sounds like he's in trouble. Come on. Kent! It's the prince. But look at his throat. It's been mangled in exactly the same way. Oh, I can't believe it. How can two dogs be killed right under our noses? Why didn't they bark? Why didn't they struggle? Let's have a look at the ground. I, I, I can't understand. Charles, what is it? Come over here. Look at this. Uh, what's that? Footprints, yes. In this wet patch of ground. Look at the size of them. They're over a foot long. What kind of an animal could have made those prints? I don't know, but I thought I'd seen the tracks of every animal under the sun, but I've never seen anything like this before. We seem to have run into a new type of monster, Charles. And a killer as well. <laughs> Since the beginning of time, knowledge has been man's best reassurance against fear. It has always been the unknown, the incomprehensible, that he has been afraid of. The first mammoth tracks for the prehistoric man, the first gorilla prints for the African savage, and now, for three lone hunters, these mysterious and fearsome impressions in the mud. Have you found any more prints, Kent? No. Just these three. Three? Yes, like a triangle. Well, you think this, this creature may be three-legged? I don't know. Well, what will we do? I haven't decided yet. We're only carrying small bore guns. If this monster's as big as you think it is, we... Well, the hunter seems to be a little worried. His gun isn't big enough. He needs nothing less than an armored tank to bag a rabbit. One more crack out of you, bud. Brother-in-law or no brother-in-law? Well, I'll take it easy. My two best dogs. Massacred like chickens. If I could get a bead on whatever did the job, I... You want to try? Hard game if you are. I once saw a man bring down a lion with a light Springfield rifle. It was a lucky shot and it took nerve, but he did it. Between the two of us... The two of us is right. We won't get any help from this fool over here. I'll tell you what I'll do, Charles. I'll take the place of your dogs. What? I'll scout for you. I'm good at that sort of thing. You just watch the old bloodhound hit the trail. I'll yell if I see anything suspicious. Bud! Come on, let's follow him. Those footprints baffle me completely. Why only three? And the web marks, I can't make those out either. They look something like a duck print. A duck? Providing you could find a duck that was nine feet high. Is that how big you think the animal is? At least. I wonder... You wonder what, Charles? Well, I, I've heard stories... Wait a minute. Bud! Yes? You all right? The old flat hand is still on the trail. What were you saying about uh, stories, Charles? Well, they had to do with prehistoric monsters, swamp creatures from out of the past. Well, whatever it is, we'll... we'll catch up with it soon enough. Charles, wait. What's the matter? I want to examine this tree. You find anything unusual? Look at these holes. What are they? I'm, I'm not sure. But they could have been caused by heavy claws. Nothing in the branches up there. Yet something must have scraped and climbed part of the way up this trunk very recently. Our quarry, Charles. May have wanted to keep an eye out. For us. I, I, I don't like this, Mrs. Kent. Neither do 
why. I think we ought to go back for more help. We could round up a party of 20 or so and beat the woods in a circle. Then, with bigger guns, we'd be in a better position. Yes, that's not a bad idea. Well, let's get started. Wait a minute. We've got to get Bud back here. Bud! Bud! He must have got too far ahead of us to hear. We'd better catch up with him, Charles. It would serve the idiot right if he got lost. He can't be too far away. We're only separated by a couple of hundred yards. Bud! Where are you, Bud? He tried to trick us. I don't think so. You don't know this brother-in-law of Charles. What? Don't move. What do you see? There's something in that underbrush. Oh, blast its head off. Don't fire. Wait until it moves. I don't see anything. Come a little closer. Quiet. Kent! Kent, look! It's Bud. His... His throat, Kent. He's dead. Bud! Bud! Got to get out of these woods, Kent. Not so fast. Let me take a look at the ground over here. Another sound. He didn't make a sound before he died. He never had a chance. Charles. Well? The same print. The web feet. Yes. Three of them. Where do they meet? They don't. They just stop there. Well, the only thing we can do is to get back to town and inform yes. the authorities. We can do that. What do you mean, if? How far into these woods have we gone? Oh, three or four miles, and I know every inch of the way there. Perhaps our quarry does, too. What? What are you getting at, kid? We may as well face it, Charles. We're not the hunters anymore. We are the hunted. I don't know what you mean. We're being tracked down and slaughtered one by one, the way I've tracked and slaughtered so many animals myself. Oh, are you going crazy, kid? No, I'm not going crazy. I'm just being honest and logical. Do you remember what Bud said to us last night? How would we feel if the roles were reversed? If the animals hunted us? Yes. Now I know what he meant. That's exactly why I want to get back to town. We can't run away from it. If we get panicky, we haven't got a chance. Then so what can we do? Face it, Charles. And use the strongest weapon we still have. Our brains. You mean, we've got to out outwit this? This horror? Yes. And we can do it, too, if we keep our heads. I've hunted all over the world, and I know every trick that there is to know about tracking game. Surprise is the hunted animal's biggest asset, and we'll use it. All right. We are no longer the hunters, Charles. Remember that. We're the quarry now. Have you ever wondered how it feels to be a hunted beast? Well, Charles and Kent are finding out. Listen. We're only a couple of miles from the edge of the woods now. Don't hurry. Walk slowly and watch. Kent. Yes. Look at that rock. It's a blood smear. Fresh. I'd say it was made in the last five minutes. Then, then that monster must be nearby. Can you climb, Charles? Climb? A tree. It forks about ten feet up. We'll be fairly safe there for a while. I, I think I can make it. Go ahead. I'll cover you as you go up, and then you can cover me when I follow. All right. I, I've got a plan in mind that may work. We'll go over the details up there. Oh, how much longer we must we roost up here in this tree, Kent? Now, be patient. Your life is worth a little discomfort, isn't it? We've been here for hours. We haven't seen anything. But we're still alive. Well, what about that plan you talked about before? Yes, I think it might. Shouldn't we get on with it? It's getting dark. That's exactly what I'm waiting for. The dark? Yes. We, we, we'll be at a disadvantage. Oh, no, we won't. The hunter are the most dangerous in the dark, and we are the hunted. Charles. Well? There's something I want to tell you about. What is it? It's about Diana and me. Diana and you. You're a good friend of mine, Charles. I've... Well, I've just got to be honest with you. This thing's been on my mind for so long. What is it? She's in love with me, Charles. I don't know how I feel about her, but I'm not going to wait around long enough to find out I'm leaving the country. 
If we ever get out of here alive. And I'm leaving for good. Well? Hey, you need to make any excuses. I don't care any more about Diana than she does about me. And you weren't the first man she's gone for since we were married. What? Well, she thinks she's been very clever about it, but she doesn't fool me. Certainly surprised to see you taking it that way. Well, stop being surprised and get us out of here. That's the only thing that interests me now. It'll be dark in a few more minutes, and then we can go to work. We'll place the trap right below this tree. You're setting a trap? Yes. Something that I learned in South America. I hope it works. And if it doesn't, then it won't make any difference to either of us. Apart from Diana. How deep do you want this ditch to be? Only about eight inches and 20 to 25 inches wide. Yeah. All right. Let me have your hunting knife now. What are you going to do? Plant it in the ground. Here. Thanks. Stick it in. Blade up. Over there. Oh, yes. I'm beginning to see what you're getting at. We'll try to attract our monster in this direction and keep our fingers crossed. If he trips over that ditch, as I expect him to, then he'll fall on top of this knife blade. But won't he see the ditch? No, not if we cover it carefully with twigs and leaves. I'd better start doing that right away. There aren't enough dry leaves in this clearing, Kent. Really. Maybe some over the other side. Oh, I'll go and get some. Oh, wait a minute. I thought I heard something. I didn't hear anything. All right. When we've covered this ditch, we'll raise our voices to attract its attention. What about the rifles? We'll each take a stand on either side of the tree, and when we spring the trap, we'll both fire as well. That ought to do the trick. I wonder what it looks like. Uh, Hunter? Yes. I'd rather think, think about it. I'll get the rest of those leaves. Don't go too far. No, I'm all right. I can see up to 20 yards ahead of me. Now that the moon's coming up. Find some, Charles? Yes. Over here. All right, come back. No, wait a minute. There's something... Uh, uh, oh. Charles! No. Oh. I'm over here. This way. You can't miss me. Over this way. I trapped you! Kate! Diana! Diana! You can't me. Oh, no. The monster wasn't. Wasn't you? I, I was rather favorite about it. So that's why the dogs didn't make a sound. They recognized you. I, I didn't want to kill you, Kat. Just the others. And the dogs had to go before I could get to them. But why, Diana? Why did you do it? I, I killed Bud for his money. And I killed Charles for you. I... I used these hooks. Strapped to my fingers. You must have been insane. Uh, insane? The footprints. They were your rubber swimming fins. Yes. But your trap was more. Diana. Don't try to move. You're only wasting your time. Remember, I wished you good hunting, Captain. Well, I trust you had it with me. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock.
The wheels of chance, like the hands of time, move slowly. But time is more dependable. Chance is not only a gambler and a knave, it's also a playwright. And like the egotistical creature it is, it plays all the parts, including the hero and the villain. Tonight I'd like to tell you of one of its masterpieces, which Chance co-authored with its very good friend, Coincidence. <laughs> a fine pair, Chance and Coincidence. And a lusty match for anyone. Well, the place, Somerville, a drowsy little town with a population of 2,704, including Mrs. Wilson's twins, which were born last week. Somerville's vital statistics are recorded in the town hall, and if you look up the figures on crime, you'll find that Somerville is a very law-abiding place. The last outbreak of violence occurred on June 4th, 1943, when two young boys swiped three or four potatoes from the bin in front of Mr. Gorsey's general food store. The punishment was swift and just, and was meted out by the culprit's parents. The principal character in our story is a man named Howard Williams, a recent arrival in Somerville. He has a wife and two children, a boy and a girl, and two occupations, accounting and minding his own business. The time? Well, the time is now. Oh, good evening, Mr. Williams. Good evening, Mr. Hawley. I, I took two of your papers from the stand outside, the Star and the Gazette. Oh, well, that's eight cents. Uh, anything else? Not just now, thank you. Good. I understand you got yourself fixed up at the cottage on Spring Street. Eh? Yes, I was quite a break. Houses aren't easy to rent these days. Uh, I take it then that you'll be staying in Somerville for a while. Hmm? I'm going to make it my home, Mr. Holly. Oh, now, that's fine. That, that's real fine. You, you'll find the folks hereabouts are plain, not very exciting, but they're nice people to know. I think we're going to like it here. I'm sure you will. Uh, you, you like detective stories? Not particularly, but, but my wife does. Oh, fine. Well, now, look, I got a new issue in today. I thought you might like a copy. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice for reading by the fire and scaring the tar out of you in a long winter's night. I'll buy a copy for Hazel. <laughs> she gets a big kick out of stuff like that. Oh, good. Here you are, Mr. Williams. That's uh, 23 cents and all. Uh -huh. Thank you. Hey, this, this first story sounds like a thriller. There's a crime that was almost perfect. <laughs> oh, Hazel should like that. She's always getting me into arguments about the perfect crime. She, sure. she reads so much of this stuff, she believes the perfect crime is impossible. Impossible? Uh, well, uh, don't you? Oh, it seems to me there's many an unsolved murder case in the police files. Of course, I, I don't know much about those things, but I imagine a man could kill another man and get away with it if he planned it carefully enough. Ah, oh, yes, but there's always a slip-up, isn't there? Well, maybe there is. I, I couldn't say. No, my business is accounting. I prefer leaving the criminology to someone else. <laughs> it's a good idea. I want a pack of cigarettes, Kensington. Very good. Here you are, ma'am. Uh, do you know where I can get a room for the night? Uh, Somerville Hotel is just about three blocks up. No, I tried that. I phoned. They don't have anything. Uh, well, the only other place I know of is Mrs. Cop's room and house. Where's that? It's just outside, about, about two miles up. Is there a bus that goes in that direction? Oh, yes, see, you can catch it right in front of the door. Oh, good. Thanks very much. Oh, don't mention it. A stranger in town, I guess. Mighty pretty, too, eh? Well, I, I think I'll be on my way, Mr. Holly. I'm afraid I'm late for dinner. <laughs> well, I'm certainly glad to hear you're going to make Somerville your home, Mr. Williams. We're one big happy family in this town, and we always welcome newcomers. Well, it's good to have friends, Mr. Holly. Lots of friends, and I hope to make them here. I, I'm a simple man with simple tastes, and I've always wanted to raise my family in a community like this. Drop in again soon, Mr. Williams. I will, and, and thanks. Good night. Well, the weather's awful, isn't it? Uh, no, it looks like we're in for a storm. It's beginning to hail. How often do those buses run past? I'm not sure. Every 15 minutes, I imagine. Maybe I can get a cab. I'm going in your direction. You are? And I have a car over there. Can I give you a lift? Well, I'd hate to put you to any trouble. No trouble at all. Um, maybe you'd better not. Why? Oh, well... Oh, well, I guess it's all right. Which car did you say was yours? Uh, the gray sedan. Oh, let's go. Hey, do you mind if I stop at this gas station for a minute? My tank's a little low. No, it's all right with me. I'll fill her up, mister? Yes, please. And uh, check the oil. Uh, do you have a phone inside? Oh, yes, ma'am. I'll be right back. No hurry. Eh, hey, rough night, ain't it, mister? Blowing up. Mm. Better watch the road out of town. This hail ain't gonna do it much good. Mm, well, I'm not going very far. Say, your left front tire's kind of smooth. Uh, 
You better get a chain. I intend to buy a whole new set next week. Oh, can I take your order for it? I suppose you can. Uh, my name is Williams. I'll I'll run by here on Wednesday or Thursday and let's put them on. Okay. Say, you're new in town, ain't you, mister? Uh, we've just been here a little over a week. Well, welcome to Somerville. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. My name's Pete. Uh, I, I run this gas station. Anytime you need any advice about your bus, just drop in. <laughs> no charge for advice to neighbors. That's very kind of you. Yep. We're small town, maybe, but we get along nicely. City's a good place to visit, but no place to live. Ah, eh, you never get to know folks the way you do here in Somerville. And they seem like worthwhile people to know. <laughs> well, I'll check your battery and your water. You ready? Just about. Look, I changed my mind. I'm not going to that rooming house just yet. Do you know where the turnpike is? It's a mile from here. But it's only a crossroads. Are you driving past? Yes. Then I'll get off there. But there's nothing up the turnpike. Well, Are I... you giving me a lift or aren't you? Why, of course. Then let's get going, and you can drop me off where I asked you to, at the turn. You certainly are a careful driver, mister. It's hard to see the road in this weather. How far are we from the turnpike now? Uh, half a mile, I guess. I'll let... Uh... Well, what's the matter? I'm almost afraid to look. Just a second. I thought so. What is it? Blowout. Oh, for heaven's sake. I'm sorry. I don't like it any more than you do. It won't do my clothes any good to get down in this mud on my hands and knees, but it looks as if I'm elected. Well, I'm leaving. Well... There's nothing I can do to help, and I'm in a hurry. The turnpike's up ahead, isn't it? Well, just keep walking. You can't miss it. If you wait a few minutes, though, I'll change this tire. No, I, I can't wait. Thanks, Phyllis. We'll be seeing you. Be careful. The road's very slippery. Well, I better get started. Looks like I'll be home a good deal later than I thought. Hold it, mister! Hold it! What's the trouble? The road is blocked. There's been a crack up. You'll have to detour. Uh, which way do I go? I live on Spring Street. Well, you better turn back and make a left turn on Maple. Oh, apparently I'll never get home. Sorry, mister. Well, <laughs> nice night for ducks, anyway. Yeah, huh? ducks and murder. Uh, Maple, did you say? That's right, mister, and uh, take it easy. Howard Williams, you ought to be spanked. Now, don't be angry with me, Hazel. I couldn't help it. We'll have to send those clothes to the cleaners immediately. I only hope they can get all the mud off. Well, it's nice to be home again in front of the fire. Uh, is that robe warm enough for you, dear? Now, stop worrying, dear. I don't catch colds as easily as that. Howard, I met one of our neighbors this afternoon, Mrs. Harvey. Oh, she was awfully nice. She kept asking me if there was anything she could do to help make us comfortable. Everyone here seems to be that way, Hazel. It's going to be nice living in Somerville. After all we've been through, it'll be like making a brand new life for ourselves. Uh, you promised me you wouldn't think about it. What happened? It was like a bad dream. But I'll forget about it. In time. I, I did all I could for Mr. Cagle. Sorry it ended up the way it did, then that's all. If only he hadn't dragged you into it. Your reputation. Hazel. Let's not discuss it, huh? Are you happy, Howard? Right now, I'm very happy. There's a great deal more to living than making money, Hazel. When you have peace... And contentment when, when you have good friends and neighbors. Oh, I'll take it, dear. Hello? Mr. Williams there, please. Who's calling? My name is Mallory. Lieutenant Mallory, State Police. Police? Just a moment. Police? Yes. Hello? Mr. Williams? Yes? I'm sorry to trouble you, Mr. Williams, but I was wondering if you might give me some information. About what? You know a woman named Laura Pearson? Why, no. Are you sure? Uh, quite sure. We didn't think you'd know her, but uh, Mr. Hawley mentioned something about your being in his stationery store when she came in for cigarettes. A uh, tall girl, good-looking, bleached blonde hair. Oh, uh, oh yes, I, I remember now. Good. I wonder if you'd mind dropping into headquarters for a few minutes. Now? Well, if it's not too much trouble, we won't keep you long, but you may be able to 
Help us out. Well, uh, if it's important... Yeah, it's very important. You see, we found Laura Pearson about an hour ago. She'd been strangled at death. <laughs> Yes, the town of Somerville is very small, and you'd never find it on the map. But things do happen in Somerville. On this particular evening, for instance, at exactly 8.45, Howard Williams stepped into Lieutenant Mallory's office at police headquarters and was formally introduced to fear. Sit down, Mr. Williams, sit down. Do you remember Pete, the owner of the gas station? Oh, uh, hello, Pete. Hello. Pete told me you'd met a couple of hours ago. He's the guy, Lieutenant. She was riding with him when he stopped for gas. According to Pete, Mr. Williams, Miss Pearson was seen in your car just before her body was found. I, I could have told you that myself if you'd asked. Naturally, naturally. Uh, how did you come to pick her up, Mr. Williams? I, I didn't pick her up. No? No. I gave her a ride. Oh, but... I'm sorry. Uh, I'm afraid I put it in the wrong terms. Exactly what occurred between you and Miss Pearson this evening, Mr. Williams? Well, I, I met her outside the stationery store mm -hmm. and offered her a lift to Mrs. Carp's. She made a phone call at the gas station. Is that right, Pete? I guess so. Well, of course it's right. Why should I lie to you? Oh, I beg your pardon. I, I didn't mean to infer that you'd lie. Uh, please go on with your story. Uh, well, that's about all there was to it. Instead of going to Mrs. Carp, she asked me to drop her off at the turnpike. Oh, why? She didn't say why. Mr. Williams, the turnpike is uh, over a mile from Mrs. Carp's. That's an odd place for a young girl to go in weather like this. Well, it wasn't any of my business why she was going there. And, and I didn't ask her. I, I only... Just a minute, please. Flanagan, send Mr. Hawley in. I'm afraid I can't help you out very much in connection with Miss Pearson. I never saw her before tonight, and I... Uh... Oh, come in, uh, Mr. Hawley. Howdy. Good evening, Mr. Hawley. I said good evening. Yes, I heard you. Mr. Hawley, did Mr. Williams and the Pearson woman recognize each other when they met in your store? Well, uh, I can't recollect that they did. All I know is that it... Say, you know, that, that's very funny. What is? Weren't you wearing a brown suit about three hours ago, Mr. Williams? Why, yes. Why did you change your clothes? Well, because my other suit. Wait a minute. What is this, Lieutenant Mallory? I, I'm beginning to feel as if you're questioning me like, like a suspect. Oh, no, no not at all. We merely want whatever information you can supply. But I won't question you any more right now, Mr. Williams. Uh, perhaps I'll get in touch with you again tomorrow. Thanks a lot for coming in. That's all right. Oh, just a second. Uh, Mr. Hawley tells me your wife reads detective stories. What about it? He said that you and she were discussing the perfect crime this evening. Perfect crime? <laughs> well, I know how it is, Mr. Williams. I sometimes read detective stories myself. Good night. What happened, Howard? I don't know. He questioned me. About this girl. And that was all. They certainly don't think that you had anything to do with it. Of course not. I, I saw her before the murder, so naturally they want me to give any information I can. Well, I never even met the girl before. It's ridiculous. They haven't got anything on me. They can't prove anything. They... Hazel. Yes, dear? You know I had nothing to do with this, don't you? You don't have to defend yourself to me, Howard. Defend myself? What? Yes, that's what I'm doing now, isn't it? Defending myself. It just doesn't make sense. I have nothing to defend myself against, Hazel. Have I? Sorry to disturb you again, Mr. Williams. What is it now, Lieutenant? There's a man named Cy Parker who lives about a mile north of the turnpike. I'm afraid I don't know who he is. Well, he may know you, however. He does? I seem to give me a pretty good description of you. He said he warned you away from the roadblock uh, early this evening. Oh, he must be the man who told me to detour. That's right. He also said you were alone. What about him? That you looked like you'd been through some kind of a crack-up yourself. But I look like a... But he said he noticed mud on your face and hands, and you seemed to be rather annoyed at being held up. Well, naturally, the weather was foul, and 
But as far as the mud was concerned... Those your clothes on that chair there? Yeah. Brown suit. Were you wearing it tonight? Yes. It's muddy, isn't it? Well, I, I had to fi fix the flat tire. Oh. Mr. Williams, you'll have to return to headquarters with me. What for? Well, there are two or three loose ends that have to be cleared up. Loose ends? What do you mean? When we found Laura Pearson's body, uh, her clothes were also covered with mud. Have another beer, Si? Yeah, I don't mind if I do. I never would have figured him for it. Uh, didn't look like that kind of guy to me. You mean you really think he killed that gal? Well, no, I'm not the type who'd pin a man against the wall without proof, and I believe in fair trial by jury. According to law, a man's innocent until he's proven guilty, right? Right. But between you and me, Si, who else could have done it? And I saw the way he looked at her when she came into my store, I tell you. I don't care if he never seen her before. I know what goes on in a man's mind when he sees a girl like that. He's got a wife and two kids besides. Say, you think maybe he's crazy, Holly? Cra uh, crazy? Crazy? Uh, look, a lunatic don't plan a killing the way he planned this one. Look at how slick he did it. Oh, no. Oh, he ain't no crazier than I am, a murdering rat. Uh, well, Judge, uh, he was sitting with this woman in the car, and it seemed to me they knew each other a lot longer than he said he did. Uh, anyway, uh, he told me to fill up his tank, and I figured uh, he was going for a ride, uh, a long ride, with her. He was as nervous as a cat, Judge, and dirty in a mongrel, too. He kind of stared at me when I mentioned something about the weather, and... That it was a nice night for murder. He talked like he knew a lot about crime, Judge. <laughs> now, we, we had this argument about the story, see? And he said to me, uh, uh, wait till I get the words right. He said, uh, I imagine a man could kill another man and get away with it, if he planned it carefully enough. When the body was examined, the coroner concluded that she'd only been dead for half an hour. He, uh, filled his gas tank at 7.10. Cy Parker steered him away from that roadblock at 7.40. It's only a ten-minute drive from the gas station to the roadblock at the most, but apparently it took Williams almost 40 minutes. We, uh, also discovered that the defendant had been involved in an embezzlement case in Chicago. He was acquitted. He left the city soon after. And it is the judgment of this court, Howard Williams, that you be sentenced to hang by the neck until you are dead. Well, I haven't been very kind to poor Howard Williams so far, have I? But let's see what I have in store for him as his wife visits him in the cell. Howard. Hello, Hazel. Howard, they... They just told me... There'd be no reprieve. I know. Told me an hour ago. Howard, what are we going to do? What can we do? They can't kill an innocent man. I don't believe it. They couldn't. You're the only one who believes I'm innocent, Hazel. Oh, why did we come here? Why did we ever come to this horrible place? <laughs> don't. All the kids. They, they asked for you. <laughs> Hazel, I want you to leave now. Please? It'll make it easier for both of us. Will this be the last time I'll be able to see you? Yes. Howard. No, don't, don't say any more. Tell them outside that I want to see the prison chaplain. I refused to talk to him earlier. But I've changed my mind. Goodbye, Hazel. No. No, I won't say goodbye. You still have time. There's still a chance. There's still a chance. I'm afraid there isn't a Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Williams. You asked to see me? Yes. Open the cell door, Haggerty. You can leave us, Haggerty. Hazel, will you leave us, too? Well, I'll wait outside. Pretty tough on her. Yeah. Even tougher than it is on me. I'm sorry, William. Mallory. 
I have a favor to ask you. Yeah? What is it? One day, Mallory, you'll find that I was innocent. Will I? You're a good detective. One of the best in the state. Something will turn up. Something that will make you think. And reopen this case. Perhaps. All I ask is that when you do hit on new evidence, you'll prove me innocent. It won't do me any good, I know, but, but at least my name will be cleared. And, and my family will be happier. I see. I, I know it's a lot to ask, but I swear to you that I, I didn't murder that woman. I'm going to die in a couple of hours, and I wouldn't lie at a time like this. You've got to believe me, Mallory. I'm not guilty. I believe you, William. You know? I not only believe you, but I'm sure you're telling the truth. You sure? Did you, did you say? Yeah. But how can, how can you be sure? I, I mean... It's very simple. Very simple. Uh-huh. I know you're innocent because I also know who killed Laura Pearson. Well, then why didn't you tell him? Why in the name of heaven? Don't you tell him that you, you know? I can't, William. You see, I killed him myself. What? Yeah, I was the one who called. She, she called that night from the gas station. I was the one she met, Williams, at the turnpike. No. She deserved to die. She was a blackmailer, a cheat. She wouldn't take no for an answer when I told her we were through. I have a family of my own to think about. You, you tell me that now? You wouldn't expect me to mention it in the courtroom, would you? Yes, I killed Laura Pearson. There are only two people who know about it now, Williams. And after tonight, there'll only be one. You're wrong, Mallory. Oh? There's someone else you didn't count on me. He's just outside the cell door. What? Did you hear what he said, Chaplain? Did you hear? Yes, I heard. Chaplain, as a man of God, you've got to keep a confidence. You can't tell them. You won't. No, Lieutenant. I won't. But you will, my son. Yeah, you're right, Chapman. I guess I will. And that is the story of Howard Williams as recorded by the clock. Chance and coincidence. Collaborators extraordinary. Their scenarios are always good, and I ought to know, because time is their editor. I'd be very honored if you'd join me again in exactly 10,050 minutes' time, or, if you prefer it, in exactly 167.5 hours' time, when I'll be here to tell you another of my stories. Until then, I wish you all happy time. The clock will be heard next week in exactly 10,050 minutes' time from this same station. Written by Lawrence Clee with Hart McGuire as narrator, you heard Charles Tingwell as Howard Williams and Ken Wayne as Mallory. Others in the cast were Wendy Playfair, Joe McCormick, Don Crosby, and June Salter. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Have you ever wished you could live your life all over again? Perhaps you have. Three score and ten is our allotted time, and yet it might be nice to repeat the process and see how many past mistakes we could avoid in our second tour around the clock. For none of us are perfect. Well, almost none. I have in mind one gentleman who thought he was at any rate. His name was Alexander Doby. No one ever said no to Mr. Doby. He was much too rich. No one ever crossed him. No one ever matched his will until a late afternoon in January at the age of 52 when our friend Alexander Doby... Uh, but I'm getting ahead of my story. Let me give it to you in more detail. Oh, 
Good afternoon, Mr. Dobie. Good afternoon. I don't remember you're making an appointment. I never make appointments, Dr. Renner, particularly with dentists. Oh. I arrive when I arrive and I leave when I leave. I don't have time to keep appointments. What seems to be the trouble? What do you think would be the trouble when I visit a dentist? I have a toothache. Uh. If my regular dentist hadn't taken a winter vacation, I wouldn't be here now. Dr. Simpson, of course you've heard of him, uh, best man in town, charges $30 a filling. I only charge five. Then you can't be very good. However, I have a double purpose in coming here, as you undoubtedly know. I uh, think I can guess. Hmm? You open wide, please. Uh, the big one on the upper left next to the... Oh, oh I'm sorry. Well, what What are you trying to do? Torture me? Well, you've got quite a cavity there. You needn't tell me it's my tooth, isn't it? Will you uh, have to drill? Well, naturally. Will it hurt? Probably. Well, I don't want it to hurt. Blast it. I haven't got time to be in pain. Would you like some gas? Gas? Well, you won't feel a thing if I give you gas. I hope not. Lena, how long have you known my daughter? Oh, it's been almost a year, Mr. Doby. That's almost a year too long, young man. Just what are your intentions? Hasn't Arlene told you? She doesn't have to tell me. I know what's going on. Well, Mr. Doby, as long as you bring the matter up... Well? Well, I, I want to marry Arlene. You want to What? Well, I... I had every intention of coming to see you very soon. What is your income, Renner? Five thousand a year. That's gross, isn't it? Yes. And after your overhead is cleared, your office, instruments, and so on, what's left? Well, about... about three thousand, I guess. Three thousand a year. Sixty dollars a week, and you want to marry my daughter. Well, Mr. Doby, I... Oh, I... I know what you're after, my enterprising young fellow. Don't think you're getting ahead of me. I'm not quite sure I know what you mean, Mr. Doby. Heiresses aren't easy to come by, are they? Particularly for inconsequential pipsqueaks like you. Mr. Doby, you're going a little too far. Please, let's not quarrel. You're Arlene's father and I... You can bet your last bicuspid I'm her father. But I'm never going to be your father-in-law. Now, do you hear that? From now on, your little romance is finished. I don't want you to see my daughter again. Is that clear? Very... I can make a lot of trouble for you, Renner, so keep it in mind. I will, Mr. Doby. Well, now get on with that, too. And if I so much as feel one twinge of pain, I'll bite a hole in your hand. Well, what's that? I'm ready to give you the gas now. Well, don't stand there like an idiot. Give it to me. Well, we'll just put this mask over your face. Okay. Now, breathe naturally. Well, uh... How else do you think I can breathe? Well, this will only take a minute. I'm pretty careful with that fool thing now. Don't give me too much. I know my business, Mr. Dolby. I'm going to give you just enough. Is this stuff uh, dangerous? It could be if it's not handled properly. So you're coming between Arlene and me. You bet your boots I am. And I'll ruin you, Renner, if you so much as... as... Say... Say, wait a minute. I, I, I feel peculiar. Breathe deeply, Mr. Doby. Get this thing off me. I, I don't want any gas. Just a few seconds more. Oh, oh I don't want any more. You're trying to kill me. Take that mask away. Take it away, you hear? You're killing me. You're killing me. Say something, Mr. Derby. Who is it? to you. My name is Ipswich. That's not a name. That's a railroad station. Where am I? In a room. Oh, I know I'm in a room. You... That dentist, Renner. Now I remember. He tried to kill me. Did he? Gave me gas. Get hold of the police. I'm having that man jailed immediately. Now, let me see. I believe I have a list of your vital statistics here. Did you hear what I said about the police? I suggest you relax, Mr. Doby. It'll make it so much easier for both of us. See, where am I? In a lunatic asylum? What am I doing in a bare room? 
How did I get here? My tooth doesn't hurt. Alexander Doby, aged 52. Widower, one child, place of birth, Rochester, New York. Member of the Stock Exchange, president of the Universal Copper Company, Incorporated. How do you know so much about me? It's my business to know everything about everyone, Mr. Doby. Listen, you crackpot. I just told you a man tried to murder me. Now, are you going to call the police or must police? I? Police? There are no police, Mr. Doby. What? And I know all about Dr. Renner and you. Too much guess. It's happened before, still it's more pleasant than falling out of the window, isn't it? You must admit you left the world with ease and comfort. Left the world? You... You talk as if I'm dead. But you are, Mr. Derby. You are dead. I... I just can't believe it. It, it isn't possible. It's happened before, Mr. Derby. You're not the first man to arrive at the middle level. There have been several billion before you. Middle level? What middle level? Why haven't I been taken to the upper level? Well, first, there are references to be checked, Mr. Derby. Of course, the references aren't so important on the uh, lower level. Let's see, you needn't worry. We'll see you get in somewhere. I've got hundreds of references, Ipswich. Really? Odd they're not listed here. Well, apparently you don't know who I am. Oh, yes, you're Alexander Doby, age 52. I also happen to be Alexander Doby, the richest man in the East. I'm on the board of directors in three banks. I'm a member of five of the most exclusive clubs in America, and it would take you a week to walk across my real estate if it was laid end to end. I still don't see any references on my list. Then your list is a forgery, Ipswich. Ask any businessman in New York who I am. He'll tell you without blinking an eyelash. I'm afraid you misunderstand me, Mr. Derby. I'm talking about personal references now. Personal references? Yes, in order to reach the upper level, someone must vouch for you. A friend or a member of your family, just one kind word in your favor is all that's needed, Mr. Derby. Oh, now, look here, Ipswich. Uh, let's not be silly about this. Uh, I'm not in the habit of asking people to vouch for me. Uh, here. What's that? Money, you fool. A hundred dollar bill. Now take it and let's get started. Dear, dear, they're getting awfully careless at the main gate. You're the third person who's come through here in the past 80 years with money. What do you mean? Money isn't needed in this area, so to speak. Money's needed everywhere. Makes the world go round. But you happen to be out of this world, Mr. Derby. Now, about that reference. Oh, are we going into that again? I'm afraid it's necessary. All right, if you insist. I can give you a reference. Fine. Uh, how do we get back? Just tell me where you want to go, Mr. Derby. Who'll give you this reference? My banker, of course. Who else? Very well, sir. We'll see your banker. This is where you bank your money, I believe. And uh, there's John Harvey, the president. Uh, John! He can't hear you, Mr. Derby. He can't? He can't see you either. Well, that's a ridiculous position to be in. But we can hear and see him. Let's go over to his desk. Mr. Harvey. What is it, Lewis? Here's that statement Mr. Doby's executor asked for. Oh, yes, yes, his asset. Mm -hmm. Wait till you hear this, Mr. Fitch. Yes, I imagine it's very impressive. He certainly was rich, wasn't he? Extremely. He had $11 million in cash in this bank alone. To say nothing of his mortgages and real estate. Yes, it's quite a fortune. Alexander Doby was even richer than I imagined. There you are, it's rich. How's that for a reference? It's still not personal. <laughs> Hard to please, aren't you? Mr. Harvey, how long do you think it took him to amass a fortune like that? It wasn't done overnight. I'll say it wasn't. He must have worked hard for it. There's your reference, Ipswich. Hard? Oh, don't be silly, Lewis. He just cheated a little better than the next chap, that's all. In order to build his fortune, he probably ruined half a dozen men. I know what Doby's kind was like. The last of the robber barons. He, he doesn't know what, what he's talking about, doesn't he? I hate to say this about a man who's gone, Lewis. But Alex Doby's death was no loss to the world. I doubt if anyone will miss him. There are many people who've already forgotten he ever existed. Shall I send this report to his attorneys, Mr. Harvey? Yes, get it over with. I'm going out for lunch and a round of golf. Well, Mr. Doby? That's a fine way for a man to treat a client. That's all I have to say. He'll never get another nickel of my business. I'm sure he won't. Anyway, he was always jealous of me. And he was never a very good friend. Then suppose we visit... A good friend, Mr. Derby. Uh, yes. 
Well, all right. Who shall we see? Oh, anyone at all. It doesn't matter. I've got lots of friends. They're good friends, too. I'm glad to hear that. Oh, let's see now. Good friend. Mm, uh, this will be time. It's which. Uh, I'll think of one. Uh, uh, it's which. Yes, Mr. Derby? Uh, not that I uh, expect to disappoint you. And, and just for the sake of argument, out of sheer curiosity, uh, what would happen if I... Didn't uh, produce a reference. I wouldn't talk about that now, Mr. Derby. I demand to know. It isn't a pleasant subject. What are you getting at? Mr. Derby, we haven't too much time, so let's get on with it. Have you or have you not a personal reference to offer? I certainly have. Uh, I hope. On this earth, time is measured in seconds, minutes, and hours. In Mr. Dobie's new world, time is calculated in eternities. Days, months, and years are unimportant. There is only now and later. And in Mr. Dobie's case, it was later than he thought. Hey, isn't that my country club with Twitch? You said you wanted to hear from Charlie Parker, I believe. Well, we'll find him on the golf course. <laughs> Good old Charlie. He spent ten years trying to beat me at golf, but he can never touch my game. Were you that good? Good. I was number two man at the club. Oh, there's Charlie now, walking towards the first tee. Let's join him. Hey, hey wait a minute. He's playing a twosome with John Harvey. Now, listen, we, we, we just saw Harvey, and what he says doesn't count. I'm only interested in what Mr. Parker has to say. Hello there, Charlie. Oh, afternoon, John. You're late. Sorry, I was going over Alex Dorby's account. Oh, uh, yeah, Alex died the other day, I hear. He was a very good personal friend of yours, wasn't he? Oh, I knew him quite well. Go on, Charlie. Tell him how we got along. Tell him what a wonderful chap I was. He used to play quite a bit of golf with Alex. Oh, was he good? Uh, number two man at the club. What did I tell you, Ipswich? Should have been number one man, the way he kept his score. Well, really? Yeah, if he took ten strokes, he'd put down five. Yeah, it was just about the biggest golf liar I ever met. Now, look here, you old windbag. I told you they can't hear you, Mr. Dillon. So he cheated in golf as well as in everything else. Yeah, yeah, not only that, but he did it for money. No money? I can forgive a man who forgets a stroke or two on his scorecard. Oh. I mean, after all, we're, we're only human. It's oh. nice to feel you're... Well, it... Uh... Kid yourself that you're an athlete at the age of 50 or so. <laughs> oh, I know what you mean, Charlie. But uh, Dobie always insisted on playing for money. Five dollars a hole, and he always made sure to win every hole in the bargain. With his pencil, eh? <laughs> it was really disgusting, Harvey. He was richer than any man I'd ever known. Yet he, he'd cheat for a five-dollar bill. Can you imagine that? Oh, I guess not. But as I understood it, Parky, you were his closest friend. You don't seem to be very unhappy about his passing. His closest friend? Yeah, I was his closest friend. I knew what was good for me. He held 51% of the stock in my company. He could have ruined me at the drop of a hat. That's why I made sure to be his closest friend. Oh, I see. He did, personally. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do? You know how I'm going to mourn his death? No. By getting tight in the clubhouse after this round of golf. <laughs> and it's going to be more of a celebration than anything else. <laughs> Come on, let's go. <laughs> well, well, that's that. I... I would never have believed it, a Charlie... Never. Did you cheat at golf, Mr. Doby? Cheat? As Parker claimed. Well, I uh, I admit taking a stroke or two off my card here and there, but uh, what difference did it make? It was all in fun. Fun at five dollars a hole. Now listen to me, Ipswich. Mr. Doby, I'm afraid I'll have to inform the secretary. What? You don't seem to be able to provide a reference. Now look, Ipswich, you, you've got to give me a break. A break? I'm due for the upper level, and you know it. And by George, you're going to take me there. I'm sorry, Mr. Dobie. Now, now, wait a minute, Ipswich. I'm a rich man, a very rich man. All that talk about not using money was just plain silly. You know it was. Oh, I admit I underestimated you by offering you a hundred dollars, but but I, I'll raise that offer. Will you? To, to a million. Hmm. Well, how's that, eh? A million dollars in cash. And uh, you don't have to report it to the government if you don't want to. I, I, I'll keep quiet myself uh, to save the tax. Uh, see what I mean? Only a reference and a good one will do the trick, Mr. Derby. I won't go any higher, Ipswich. Either you take two million or the deal's off. 
Fine. The deal is off. Wait, wait. Don't leave me a twitch. Maybe I uh, made a mistake. Maybe you're the one man who doesn't have his price, but uh, don't leave me alone. I'm, uh, I'm a little frightened. The great Alexander Doby. Frightened. Well, I, uh, I've never been in a position before where my money was useless. I am not used to that sort of thing. Blast it. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. That's a concession for you. Uh, look, Ipswich, I mean, uh, Mr. Ipswich, uh, uh, maybe you can help me out. I? Well, you've known me for now, uh, well, uh, well, for uh, quite a while. Couldn't you give me a reference? Sorry, employees and their families are excluded from taking part. Oh. I might make one suggestion, however. Yes? Your daughter. My daughter? Surely if there's one person in the world you've left who's sorry, it must be she. I... I never thought of Arlene. It seems to be your last chance, Mr. Derby. All right, Mr. Ipswich. We'll see how Arlene feels about it. Poor Mr. Dolby. Fancy, a million dollars, not enough to buy what he wants. Let's hear how he gets on with Arlene. This is my home, Mr. Ipswich. Hmm. Rather ornate, isn't it? Well, why, why, this house cost a quarter of a million dollars. The marble's imported from Italy, and, uh, well, uh, it was very expensive. Uh, let's hear what your daughter has to say. That young man who's with her, we saw him a little while ago. Uh, that's Lewis, the bank accountant. I'm sorry to disturb you at a time like this, Mrs. Hill Adobe. That's quite all right, Mr. Lewis. I have brought a copy of a statement I gave the executor of your father's estate. I thought you might want to keep it in your files. Thank you. We were all deeply shocked at the bank, Miss Doby. Your father's death was so sudden. I, I want you to know that you have all our sympathy. Thank you. But you needn't put yourself out too much, Mr. Lewis, I understand. I beg your pardon? No one really misses father. No one cares that he's gone. Oh, but surely... He didn't have a friend in the world, and you know it. Arlene. To be perfectly frank with you, I'm finding it hard to care myself. I know it's a terrible thing for a daughter to say, but... Well, I can't be a hypocrite. My father gave me everything that money could buy. Everything but happiness. I'm sorry... He ruled my life like... like a dictator. I could never make a move without his knowledge. I could hardly even breathe unless he said it was all right. And before he died, he even separated me from the man I loved, Fred Renner. Fred's never come to see me, and... Well, I don't think he ever will again. My father and I had nothing in common. No matter how hard I try, I... I can be sorry. Well, Mr. Doby... All right, Mr. Ipswich, I... I guess we can call it a day. I'm ready. Just a moment. What? Someone else is standing over there. He seems to have heard what your daughter just told Lewis. It, it's Renner, that dentist. How can he have the nerve to come here, that murdering nincompoop? How can he have the crust? Why, he hated me so much he tried to kill me. In fact, by George, he did kill me. Early night... I couldn't come any sooner. Just as long as you did come, Fred, it's all right. For a while, I I thought I could never come at all after what had happened. It was an accident. Oh, you do believe that, don't you? Well, of course. The gas output was defective. I tried to bring him around, but defective. I... Defective? I like that. Arlene, I heard what you told Mr. Lewis just a few moments ago. Well, I couldn't help it. That's how I feel. But you mustn't feel that way. What? What did he say? No matter what your father was like, Arlene, he loved you. It's the one thing in his life he was sincere about. You, you must believe it. You can say that after the way he treated you, Fred. Oh, I can forgive him for it. And go one step further. Arlene, I'm, I'm sorry he's gone. I, I really am. He, he wasn't a very pleasant man, perhaps, because no one understood him. But underneath, I... I don't know. I, I feel he was decent in spite of everything. Is... Is that Raynard talking? Looks like you've got your reference at last, Mr. Doby. I can't believe it. Renner. Well, <laughs> say, that, that's mighty nice of him. It's certainly something I never expected. Wait, 
Looking my way, I thought you said he couldn't see you. It's which friend plays his ego. Seems to me I'm sure of it. Look, he's walking in my direction. What's that he's got in his hand? Looks like a mask. A gas mask. Why, the murdering weasel is going to kill me all over again. You can't kill me, you fool. I'm dead already. Take it away. Take it away. Mr. Dolby, wake up. Mr. Dolby. He's coming around. Here's an out. What happened? Who are you? Officer Callahan, police emergency squad. That respirator just saved your life, Mr. Dolby. Dr. Rennie here gave you a little too much gas. Boy, it was an accident, I tell you. My, my meter wasn't working. That's something you may have to prove, Doc. What, what do you mean? You're coming down to headquarters with me. Maybe this wasn't deliberate, but... Uh, Criminal negligence can be another story. Criminal negligence? Just a moment, officer. Who do you think you're talking to? What? Do you know who I am? Oh, sure, you're uh, Mr. Doby. Then get on about your business and leave us alone. How dare you accuse my prospective son-in-law of criminal negligence? Well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Doby. I, I didn't mean Go to... Go on back to your precinct and no report of this to anyone. You hear? Oh, yes, sir. Sorry, Dr. Renner. Dr. But uh, it's quite all right. Mr. Doby... Well? Did you did you really mean that about, about my being your prospective son-in-law? I always mean everything I say, young man. Well, let me thank you for the way you, you acted with that cop. I mean, well, it was honestly an accident, but, well, you could have made an awful lot of trouble for me. I uh, think nothing of it, Freddy. As a matter of fact, you uh, might return the favor one day. Return the favor? Well, how? Well, <laughs> you never know, Renner. When I may need a reference. Well, there you are. Alexander Doby seems to have gotten his second chance, and I have a feeling he'll do a better job with this one. Yes, at one time or another, we all need references, and it's always a good idea to keep it in mind. And if you ever want my help, don't hesitate to call. I'll be glad to provide a fitting testimonial for any of my friends. And everyone knows my reference is a good one. For after all, the time is always right. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. Lawrence Clee writes it and Hart McGuire narrates. As Alexander Doby and Mr. Ipswich, you heard Tom Farley and Ken Hannum. Others in the cast were Howard Craven, Frank Waters, and June Salter. The Clock is a Grace Gibson radio production directed by John Saul. is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. as you probably know, is the measurement of the Earth's rotation on its axis. Well, I have a little surprise for you. I've just discovered that in the year 1928, the Earth was about 25 seconds ahead of its average rotational motion during the last three centuries. Yes, it's an astronomical fact. Somewhere along the line, you gained almost half a minute since the year 1628. Well, I'm a generous fellow. You can have those 25 seconds gratis. Do as you like with them. It's all right with me. And, uh, meanwhile, just to make certain it doesn't happen again, pardon me while I wind myself up. You know, if this sort of thing continued, there's no telling where we'd be in a couple of million years. A second here and a second there all adds up. And sooner or later, someone would have to pay the piper. There, now, we can start from scratch. We're right on time again. It's always a greater satisfaction to gain time than to lose it. 
Suppose I had told you that you had lost that half a minute instead of gaining it. Wouldn't that have upset you more? No. Well, then, suppose I had told you that, like Irma Stewart, you had lost seven years. How would you feel, my friends, about that? This is just our wedding rehearsal, Laura, darling. Tomorrow it'll be the real thing. Uh, I wonder if I'll have enough strength to stand up to it. <laughs> it isn't as bad as it seems. Oh, you ought to know. You've been through it before. Yes, I've been through it before. Darling, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Oh, it's quite all right. Adam, you're the only man who ever meant anything to me. And there's never been anyone else. There never will be. I beg your pardon, Mr. Stewart, but there's a gentleman to see you in the vestry room, Mr. Kelvin. Oh, yes, I I'll be right in. Kelvin? Who's he, Adam? My attorney, darling. And I know he has some very important news. I'm not needed right now. They're rehearsing the ushers. I'll be right back. Don't be long, dear. Five minutes at the most. <coughs> good afternoon. Well, Kelvin, what's the good word? The good word is that at midnight tonight, you'll be legally free, Mr. Stewart. You have the papers? Right here. Hmm. You hours, your former wife, Irma Stewart, will be declared legally dead. What are you smiling at, Kelvin? No. Was I smiling? Where are the other papers concerning the estate? They'll be ready for you in the morning. That's quite a fortune your first wife left you. Two million dollars. Great deal of money. Sometimes, Kelvin, I wonder why I employ you as my attorney. You can become downright insolent. <laughs> yes. I understand you're marrying your secretary. What about it? Does she know all the facts? She knows about my former wife, yes. And her strange disappearance, of course. Strange? What do you mean, strange? Isn't it always strange when someone vanishes? I find it, sir. Kelvin, after we complete the details of this case, you and I are through. Is that clear? And I had intended to retire in any event. On the fee I received from you. What? May I present my bill along with the papers? Fifty thousand dollars. Very reasonable, considering the service rendered. You must be crazy. On the what? contrary. I still maintain that the fee is small in comparison with the accomplishment. You see, Mr. Stewart, I have located your wife. You... You've what? Yes. Your wife is alive, Mr. Stewart. You're lying. Am I? <laughs> Do you recognize this ring? Where did you get that? It was the wedding ring you gave to Irma. Yes, the design's unusual, I must say. Lucky for you, there's no inscription on the inside. Otherwise, it would help her to know who she was. Where... Where is she? Oh, now, that's something that shouldn't concern you, Mr. Stewart. However, I can assure you that you'll never hear from her again, providing you meet your bills. When did... When did you see her, Kelvin? A week ago. And why... Why had she disappeared? Oh, now, Mr. Stewart, this is getting us nowhere. I've given you my word that you'll never see her again, and she'll never be identified. Now, isn't that enough? Well, Mr. Stewart, when shall I expect my check? Say, um, one week from today at your apartment. One week from today. <laughs> what are you thinking about, Adam? Oh, Oh, nothing important. You seem rather troubled. Oh, something happened today that uh, upset me just a little. Was that man, Kelvin? Oh, but it's really nothing. Isn't he the man who investigated your wife's disappearance? How did you know that? Oh, you told me, didn't you? Oh. Oh, yes, I... I suppose I did. Adam, what's the matter? Why are you so worried? I tell you, it's nothing at all. Uh, look, would you like to stop off at my place for a drink, Lorna? Oh, but I've so many things to do, darling. After all, the wedding is only a few hours away. Right? I, I need your company right now. Someone to talk to. Please, Lorna. All right, Adam. Of course, I'll come. Adam, did Mr. Kelvin say anything to you about your wife? Yes. What did he say? He... He told me that Irma was dead. That he had definite proof Irma was dead. I can only stay a few minutes now, darling. Remember, I'm a very busy woman. <laughs> I'm beginning to feel better already. Oh. One drink and you can be on your way. I have one or two things to finish up myself. Uh, sit down and I'll make you a highball. Oh. 
Tony, I'm so glad we decided not to live in this apartment. Are you? Well, apartments aren't so easy to get, you know. Particularly places like this. <laughs> You're a very spoiled young woman. <laughs> you can't blame me for liking the house we saw. It's so very attractive. And expensive. Oh, but you're rich, darling. Rich enough to buy you whatever you like. <laughs> Here, Lorna. Thanks. Well, to the future. Right. Do you know one reason why I don't want to live here? No. There's too much of your wife about it. Yes. That's my reason, too. Is it? I want to forget she ever existed. I want to forget she ever lived. That may not be so easy, Adam. Adam! <gasps> you dropped your glass. Adam, who is this woman? My wife. Would you leave us alone, dear? Adam! Go ahead, Lorna. I'll call you later. Please do as I say. Very well. <gasps> She's very pretty. Yes. Where did you come from, Irma? Where have you been? They tell me I've been in... in an institution for the past seven years, but I, I can't remember. You mean you've lost your memory? Partly. A week ago, a man named Kelvin came to see me. Kelvin? He asked me for my ring. He, he didn't say why he wanted it, but somehow he seemed like someone I remembered, so I gave it to him. A few hours later, I began to recall his face. I'd seen it before in the ring. I, I suddenly realized why I was wearing it. And then you remembered about me? Yes. A few days later, the doctor told me I could leave. You love her, Adam. What? The girl who just left. Well, she... She was my secretary. I asked you if you loved her. Seven years is a long time, I Mama. need you, Adam. I need you very much. You need me? I need someone to help me. I'm not completely cured yet. The doctor let me go because I, I told him you'd take care of me. But your memories returned. I said amnesia was only part of it. And the other part? Oh, would you like to know where I've been for seven years, Adam? Yes. Millview. Millview? But, but that's a hospital for... For so the insane. Oh, Adam, I love you so much. You're the only one who can help me. Adam, I lied to you. They didn't really get me. I ran away. Oh, but they did tell me I was wrong, Miss Stewart. I swear they did. You, you have a great deal of confidence in me, haven't you? Oh, but I love you, Adam. That's why I must put myself completely in your hands. Oh, will you help me? I'm... I'm glad you came to me, Irma. Are you? Very glad. And that other woman. Lorna. Oh, I'm not angry about her, Adam. I understand how it happened and why. You can forget about Lorna, my dear. Oh, can I? Can I really? From now on, there'll be just you and me. And I intend to take good care of you, Irma. Yes, I intend to take very good care of you. I won't give you up, Adam. I won't. She has no right to come back to like From the grave. Lorna, darling, be quiet. You can get a divorce. You belong to me now. There's... There's no need to get a divorce, Lorna. If... If she went back where she came from, if she were declared legally insane, the effect would be the same. But you said she was almost cured. Yes, almost. She told me herself that everything depends on me. She's standing on that precipice now. And I can lead her to safety. Or push her off. What are you saying, Adam? I don't want to lose that money, Lorna. And I... I don't want to lose you. You want to drive her out of her mind. It'll be simple. With a little help from you, there's nothing to it. You ought to see her, Lorna. She, she's like a child. She swears by everything I say. She's weak, Lorna. And we're strong. And we've got to take advantage of it. No. No, I couldn't. Do you want to forget me? Do you want to send me back to someone I detest? There's no other way? No. Adam, darling. Then you agree? I'll agree to anything if you say so. Oh, it won't take long. And no one will be any the wiser. Only this time, there'll be no return from the grave. <laughs> Oh, 
A man without pity is like a clock without hands. The mechanism of his mind may be ticking away relentlessly, but his face is inscrutable. There is this difference between the man and the clock, however. The clock has never plotted with the devil. Irma, what is the exact nature of your illness? Uh, outside of, of the amnesia, I mean. Must we talk about it? It's necessary for me to know, Irma. Oh. They... They told me I had hallucinations and I heard voices. Really? I don't remember, of course, and it hasn't happened since my memory returned. Were you ever violent? Oh, but, Adam, it, it's torture for me to talk about it. You must answer my questions, Elmer, if I'm to help you. Well, uh, I had spells occasionally, yes. Once I struck a matron. I didn't mean to. I don't even remember doing it. It was all part of the darkness I was in, part of the despair. Then that explains it. Explains what? What happened last night? Last night? It was a little after midnight. I'd been asleep for about an hour when some sound woke me. I don't know what it was exactly. And then? You were standing in the corner of the room with a kitchen knife in your hand. No. You weren't doing anything with the knife, just holding it. I asked what you wanted and... You merely shook your head. Then, without a word, you returned the, the knife to the kitchen and went back to bed. I don't understand. Why should I do... Oh, no. Don't let it worry you. This is going to take a little time. But you'll be all right. I'm not afraid. Afra you mean there's something to be afraid of in me? Well, after all, Irma, you were insane. No, don't say that. I'm terribly sorry, dear. I, I didn't mean you to... simply mustn't remind me of what happened. I've got to forget about it. Of course. Irma. Yes? Lorna's coming here tomorrow. Lorna? She's going to help me take care of you. Adam, how could you? Now, wait. There's a reason for it. First, let me tell you, there's never been anything between Lorna and me. She's a wonderful girl, and I was fond of her, but that was all. All right, I'm willing to accept that, but why must she come here? She's had some training as a practical nurse, Anna, and she can be of help. I won't stand for her being in this house, Adam. Is that how far you trust It me? has nothing to do with trust. It's impossible. Oh, don't you see how difficult it would be with Lorna here? But there's no one else I can trust as far as you're concerned, Anna. You're a long way from being cured. Some of the things you've said and done... Something. We won't go into that. Suffice it to say, Lorna would never report you to the authorities. Lorna will never tell those people at Millview where you are. And everyone can't be trusted, Irma. Adam, I'm not an escaped convict. But you may be dangerous all the same. Dangerous? Good heavens, Irma, don't you realize how close you are? But don't you say it! All right, all right, I'll leave it up to you. We can hire a regular nurse if you like, but... If she feels you should be in an institution, she may make a report of it. Well, what shall it be, Irma? Whatever you suggest. The clock moves on. I wonder what the future holds for Irma Stewart. Good evening, Mrs. Stewart. Good evening. Lorna's doing a little typing for me, Irma. Uh, you don't need her at the moment, do you? Oh, no, I don't need her. You look tired, Mrs. Stewart. Oh, but I don't feel... Well, then you were up half the night. I... I wish, wish, wish you hadn't told her, Lorna. Oh, I'm so sorry. What happened? I don't remember being away. You, you... You were doing quite a bit of screaming. Oh. Perhaps you were having a nightmare. I would have thought so if you hadn't got out of bed. I left my bed again. Now, Lorna's consented to sleep in the same room with you, beginning tonight, Irma. I'll occupy the study. I'm a light sleeper and easily aroused, just in case you might... Oh, I'm it. sure that won't be necessary. Now, let us handle this, my dear. We know what's best, don't we, Lorna? Yes, we know what's best. Now, perhaps you'd better go to bed, Irma. But I'm not tired. You'll find you are when you lie down. Did you warm some milk for Mrs. Stewart, Lorna? I left it on the night table. Drink it all now. It's good for you, Irma. Yes. It'll rest your nerves. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Stewart. Yes. Good night. You put the sedative in the milk? Yes. I'm increasing her dosage every day. Soon she'll become accustomed to it. 
and it won't put her to sleep. But her mind will be dulled, and that's what we want. Are you sure she won't find out? And if she does, to whom can she explain it? Who would listen to the word of a maniac? Now, all right, it's all over. We understand. But I couldn't have. I couldn't have. You tried to strangle Lorna. There's no question about it. She's inside now, lying down. But you'll be all right. I'm not a murderess, Annie. You know I'm not a murderess. I can only say, my dear, that you're not responsible for what you do. I made a mistake. If I'm a menace, I should have stayed where I was. I'm going to continue to help you, Anna. <laughs> until I find there's no hope. Now, go back to sleep. Let's <laughs> go. Sleep, Anna. You'll feel better tomorrow. Just go to sleep. How is she now? She's falling asleep. How much longer, Adam? Well, that's hard to say. I've got her to a point now where she believes everything I tell her. But she hasn't cracked as fast as I thought she would. Adam, I can't stand this much longer myself. Her eyes are face from me longer. It's horrible. Don't go soft on me now. We've almost reached our goal. What's the matter with you, Lorna? I don't know. It's... I just... Wait a minute. Yes? I suppose it's you, Adam. Well... Kelvin. Kelvin? Yeah. Surprised to hear from me. You shouldn't be. The week is up, you know. So it is. Well, you have my check for 50000 Yes. Good. Will you mail it? I'd rather you came and got it. I don't trust the mails, and the check is certified. Fine. I like the way you do business. I'll be up in half an hour. I'll be waiting. <laughs> he couldn't have timed it better. What do you mean? This will be our final proof, Lorna. This is all we need. She'll have the gun in her hand when they find his body. No, Adam, no. Don't you see how easy it is? She'll never deny it. She can't deny it. Adam, we're going too far. It's too much, Adam. It's not that... Be quiet. You'll do as I say. We can't turn back now. And we won't. We'll finish this business tonight. Good evening, Mr. Stewart. Oh, good evening. Come in. This is Miss Lorna Madison. Ah, yes. I've seen Miss Madison before. Well, I won't take up very much of your time. You can give it to me now and I'll leave. I intend to give it to you, all right. But I doubt if you'll be leaving. What are you... A gun? Yes. Did you think I was going to let you blackmail me for the rest of my life? I, I swear you won't hear from me again after you give me that check. I... I'll leave the country I and... I know I won't hear from you again, Kelvin, because I'm going to make sure of it. No, sir. No, don't! You killed him. Here. Take this gun and put it in Irma's hand. Well, what are you standing there for? Take it. We haven't much time. You killed him? In cold blood? Lorna... I'll get out of my way. I'll do it myself. My wife is inside, officer. Hmm. When did it happen? A few minutes before I called. I was discussing some business with my lawyer, Mr. Kelvin, when my wife walked in holding a gun. Yes, sir. Without a word, she shot him twice, then turned around and walked back to her room. I haven't tried to take the gun away from her yet. Yes, sir. Where is this other woman, the, uh, the one you said was her nurse? She's lying down in her room. It's been a terrible shock to her. She saw the whole thing, of course, and she'll testify. Uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll talk to your wife first. Uh, yes, in, in here. Adam? Yes, sir. As you see, she's still holding the gun. I'll take that gun, Mrs. Stewart. Gun? What, what gun? Oh, what am I doing with it in my hand? She doesn't remember, you see. Uh, is that the nurse standing at the door? Oh, oh, oh yes. Lorna, this is Detective Boylan. Tell him what you saw. You killed him. 
In cold blood. You killed him and put the gun in Irma's hand. I don't know what you're saying. Lorna. Lorna, tell him you're lying. <laughs> tell him. <laughs> Lorna. So far. But it was a good joke. So far. The blood was very red. And there was so much of it. She's... <laughs> She's gone out of her mind. I've driven her crazy. I've done a perfect job. I'm the wrong woman. And that is the story of Irma Stewart as recorded by the clock. I attended the trial in my usual place above the judge's bench on the courtroom wall. The verdict was swift and just. I can testify to that. And as the courtroom emptied and the crowd dispersed, I ticked away for a while by myself and followed the strange twists of destiny which managed to bring the guilty to justice and set the innocent free. And I smiled a bit complacently, perhaps, and decided that being a witness to this strange affair had done anything but... A waste of time. You'll hear the clock again next week, same time, same station. Lawrence Clee is the author, and Hart McGuire is the narrator. As Adam and Lorna, you heard Leonard Bullen and Coralie Neville. As Irma, Georgie Sterling. With David Netheim and Owen Weingott. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Oh.